I think 27 or 28, uh, got commissioned in, four, in 43 in, in uh, at Guadalcanal, and was just a really interesting, funny guy. But when he talks about his early enlisted days in the Marine Corps, and some of the characters that he had, including himself, uh, were really amusing. And one of the stories I remember particularly well, they had an inspection down at Guantanamo Bay when he was a squad leader, and they went, uh, the inspection's canceled, bad weather. Of course, that lasted 10 minutes. The sun peaked out, said, oh, back on. And none of us have done that before, I'm sure, uh, in the military. But this thing got on and off and on and off and canceled about four or five times. And my dad was, all of them were kind of frustrated, you know, and they, their shoes would get all dusty and dirty, and they were taking them off between things and, you know, retouching the spit shines and all that sort of stuff. And there was, and finally the word came down, look, the weather's bad, it's going to stay bad, it's off. So they were sitting around relaxed, reading magazines and talking. And of course, as soon as they unwound completely, the word came down, no, it's back on! So everybody outside, so they ran out there, and my dad, you know, was a squad leader, he inspected all of his people and he got back and he clicked his heels together and he realized his shoes were in the barracks and he was wearing his moccasins. <laughs> and so uh, the colonel of the barracks, the, C, the commanding officer of the Marine barracks there at Gitmo, uh, was a sort of old fatherly fellow, kind of nice fellow, and he stepped out and looked at the platoon commander and came around with the first squad, which is my dad's, and he stepped in front of my dad and looked at him, you know, and the brim was shined. We didn't have core fam in those days. He really had to work at shining stuff, and hat was covered, squared away. All of his medals and ribbons were straight. The old gig line was right. The belt buckle squared away. He got down to my dad's feet, and he looked down at my dad's shoes, and he sort of hmm, did one of these, and he looked back at my dad, and he says, uh, are you comfortable, Corporal? <laughs> <laughs> Well, those, uh, those are, and I want, let me tell you, one of the reasons I try to tell you some of these funny stories is that it is important in my mind, and I, as I was a, an officer going through, to remember the funny, quirky things that happen to you, and remember the people that do them. It really makes a difference. Uh, it cheers you up. I mean, I can't tell you how many hundreds of times I've, I've thought of these goofy things that go on. I had a uh, radio operator when I was with the British Commandos, his name was Ernie Taylor. Ernie Taylor is now a regimental sergeant major in the Royal Marines, but Ernie was just, I mean, he was a piece of work, let me tell you. His family were, were professional poachers in England, <laughs> and he had, had, had been asked to leave town somewhat quickly, uh, and so he ended up joining the Royal Marines. He was a little stocky guy and just full of energy. I mean, just, he worked like three people. And so we, but he was, t he did love to go hunting. His biggest chore was to take me duck hunting, uh, which he really loved to do. And he carried, I don't know if you're familiar with shotguns, he was about 5'9", he carried a double barrel, four gauge Ely shotgun. It had barrels <laughs> about that long, and it was about a foot taller than he was. So I'd be out there sh shooting and he'd say, oh, they're too far, sir. And after he told me they were too far and they kept flying, he'd go, boom, and shoot him right out of the air with this cannon that he had. <laughs> uh, but he was really a character, let me tell you. And, and this story, I think, says it all. We went up to Thetford, which was a training area in England, in the northern part, and very pristine and all that sort of thing, very much like England was during Robin Hood's days, I'm sure. But it was also the game preserve for a lot of the House of Commons and the British Parliament and the, and the British senior generals. And they kept these, uh, they raised pheasant up there so they could go up there pheasant hunting and it, so it wouldn't be too difficult to get a pheasant. And so they were all over. So the word was out, no guns, no shotguns, no, you weren't supposed to poach these uh, poor pheasants. So as we left, I briefed everybody in the company and they had this long list of things not to bring, <laughs> okay? And I, as I was covering, no shotguns, no slingshots, uh, and I was looking right at Ernie, because I, <laughs> I not only knew his background, I knew his, his propensities, which were to sort of capitalize. At the same time, I, when I was in England, if you can believe this, it sort of dates you a little, they still had the daily ration of rum when you were at sea. The grog 
issue. It was part of the British Navy. They got rid of it later, but while I was there, that was still a part of it. Well, Ernie wasn't a drinker, but he never, uh, every time I saw, he was down on the line, down on the line. And he used it for trading material. He'd fill his canteen up with it and trade it to somebody. So, but you never missed a chance to get. So we go to, to Thetford, and as I'm going off, I've got to go survey the ranges. And I'm leaving, and I said to Ernie, I said, Ernie, he didn't bring any guns. He didn't do anything. Oh, no, sir. Just as you followed, sir, my instructions, I've done precisely as you instructed me. Okay. So I go off on the ranges, and I come back. And that evening, I go, uh, hmm, that's not bully tinned beef, which was <laughs> in our gear for, for the chow. And uh, I said, uh, Ernie, wh what's for supper? <laughs> you know, the old Walter Conkright, what's for supper? Well, he says, uh, well, we've got some lovely pheasant here, sir. <laughs> I said, Ernie, I'll talk to you about that later. First, we'll eat the pheasant. Because uh, <laughs> it was awfully much better than that tinned garbage they were serving, and they were already dead, so what do you do about it? <laughs> and I said, okay, when it was over with, I said, okay, Ernie, tell me wh what happened. How, how did you do this? He said, well, it's just this, see this lovely bag of corn I have here? I said, yeah. He said, well, I had to go out and conduct a recce. They call it recce, not a reconnaissance. I had to conduct a recce of the area in the immediate position, you know, from our defensive position here. He said, on my way back, I sort of Hansel and gretel my way back. That's all. I didn't want to get lost, you know, so I left this trail of corn <laughs> behind me. And he said, and before you put the corn out there, he said, overnight last night, I simply took the liberty of soaking the bag of corn in my canteen cup full of rum. And I said, okay, I understand the, the, the corn gets them into camp. What's the rum all about? He said, well, most of them arrive here in no condition to resist. <laughs> <laughs> and then he looks up and he sort of smiles and he said, and we had eaten this thing, so I sort of smiled and he said, besides, my mother says it helps the gravy. <laughs> that was Ernie Taylor. My whole point in this thing is, is really remember the characters that you work with. I mean, I just, there was a never-ending parade of zany characters that I, that I loved. I really, I loved them. They were fun to be with. They weren't always legal exactly, but they sure were fun. Let's pray. Dear Father, help us to tune into your word. Thank you for the work you've already done in the hearts here. And I pray, Lord, that your spirit would guide us, teach us the things we need to know. In Jesus' name, amen. We've had a time kind of wandering through, looking at some giants, and uh, I hear that there were some identified last night. I hope some of those were put to rest and we let God take care of them. Today I want to talk a bit about what it means. There are lots of ways to look at leadership. Um, I, I go back from time to time to the British Commando course back in Limston, England, at their invitation to teach combat leadership to their young officers. And it's always interesting to hear some of their comments. I mean, British officers are a breed different than you guys altogether. Um, and I say this, let me give you some of the differences. How many of you had a job of some kind before you came to the Naval Academy, have done a job where you drew a paycheck and went to work. If you ask that question at Dartmouth, at the British, I would bet you 90% of them have never held a job of any kind. They've gone straight from school, right into the Navy. They have, they've never held a paper route. They've never pumped gas. They've never washed windows. They've never cut lawns. They just don't do those things. And so their background, in my estimation, is somewhat deprived. They're a bit underprivileged in that regard. And they're just a, a, a really different group. And one, one guy at the commando school one time asked me, he says, sir, he says, if you're in combat and you're effectively trying to lead this platoon, he says, could you tell me how do you know if you're succeeding? I thought for a moment and I said, well, if you're in combat and you're getting shot at from over there and you get up and turn around and, and you're moving toward the enemy, and you look around, there's somebody behind you, you're succeeding. If there's nobody there, you're failing, <laughs> and you're about to be in real trouble. <laughs> and it's really, leadership has a lot to do with that. It's really that simple. A leader isn't defined by a list of traits and, and things that he does or doesn't do. Uh, I mean, those are helpful, 
Uh, and I'm not saying it's not good to learn those things, but the truth is a leader is somebody who has followers. And he can do the wrong things, or the right, but if they're back there, he's a leader. Some of the most effective leaders in the world as we know them uh, in this century have been people that you would think, why would somebody follow a nut like Adolf Hitler? Now, looking back, it's hard to understand why people would follow him. If you'd been in Germany in the 20s and in the 30s, you'd understand. He brought a ray of hope. Uh, the, the economy in Germany was so bad, I mean, it's hard for us to imagine. Anybody know what the exchange rate for the dollar and the mark is right now, the German mark? What? Yeah, roughly two. It sort of bounces around. I can remember when I was a lieutenant, it was about five to one. So they've come up a good bit. But I can remember also reading stories about the German mark between World War I and World War II where they printed million mark notes, million mark notes, but they only printed them on one side. And the reason they only printed them on one side was one, to save the ink, and two, next week you could use it as scratch paper. And kids actually brought, banded together, million mark notes to school to write on, <laughs> if you can imagine such a thing. So. All of that stuff is very relative and, and, and changes. Leaders are people that have followers. If you want to be a leader, you're going to have to find a way to persuade people to follow you. I'm going to give you an insight into how to do that. And there are some very, I could talk for a couple of weeks on leadership, but I'm going to tell you, the one hour that would be the most effective is the one I'm going to give you right now. When I sit down and talk to my two boys about leadership, this is what I tell them. And I start off, as usual, as the average physics major would, in some esoteric, goofy question. And I say to myself, does everybody here understand what a capacitor is? Two plates, a charged field, a positive plate, a negative plate. Big deal. If this is the positive plate, and this is the negative plate, and I introduce an electron into that field, where does it go? to the positive plate. The negative charged electron is drawn to the positive plate. How often does that happen? Every time. Let me tell you that in leadership, that's essentially the same thing. In combat, in chaos, in the midst of the mess, people always gravitate toward the positive plate. If you think of the idea of hope, and here's the word I want you to think about today. Hope is what generates the field. When you are a ray of hope in a dark place, you generate a field around you. People understand you're a person of hope. <coughs> Colossians 1.27, we're to you know, stand ready to give a reason for the hope that's in us. Christ Jesus in you, the hope of glory. People see that, they understand it. I believe firmly that Christians have some very unique advantages in the field of leadership. Because by nature, if we're plugged in to the Holy Spirit and we're plugged in and following what God tells us to do, we are people who tend to generate a positive field of hope around us. We are people of hope. And just as clearly as that electron ding, goes over to the positive plate, people are drawn and attracted to folks who generate hope. I can tell you in combat when you've taken great losses and people are discouraged, they're out, they haven't eaten, they have been in situations where we haven't eaten for days, we've gotten ambushed, we're trying to medevac our wounded, we've got people that are really hurting. Most everybody is stunned. I mean, I'm serious. There's a, there's a thing that sets in, it's just like a fog, and people just sit there staring into space. There's a few people that will be up moving around. How are you doing? What can I get you? There are people that somehow aren't sitting there caught up in the problem. They're there offering a ray of hope to the, to the guys with them. And you know what? People follow them. It doesn't matter whether you're a PFC or a seaman first class. If you're a guy who can generate hope in a crisis, people will follow you. So what have I said here? In the business of being a leader, it is your task to generate an atmosphere around you of positive hope. 
when I talk to large corporations, and I often get to do that, speak, at, I mean, to guys who are making a hundred times what I make in a year, literally, you know what I say to them? I tell them, a leader is a guy who generates hope. He creates hope within the organization. He does that by a number of ways, but generating hope is one of the major steps that you can do. I mentioned to them about praying for their people. Sometimes they go, sure, right, next. <laughs> What's the next paragraph? And I tell them that the reason that prayer is so important in my life is it creates an atmosphere of positive hope in me. When I'm discouraged and when I'm just at wit's end and I spend time in prayer, I come out of that prayer time and I have hope. I didn't go in there with it. I come out with it. And I can't tell you exactly how it happens. But hanging around with the creator of the universe kind of tends to do that if you're, if you're sort of able to do, uh, spend some time with him. So I want you to think about this crazy idea of generating hope. And I'll mention a lot of different ways that that happens. One of the ways that you generate hope is that you develop a sense of humor. My wife has the most amazing sense of humor of anybody I have ever known. No matter what happens, she's, she's okay. She, you know, she just, every now and then she calls me aside and goes, Hemingway, this has got to stop. <laughs> and I get told exactly what, where, when, and how, and I better pay attention. But generally, she just gets up in the morning and goes about her business and it's cheerful. Let me give you an example. Um, probably, some of you have probably heard me tell this story. I've told it recently, so I don't remember if it was this group or not. Uh, getting up in the morning, uh, we had two boys, and I'd been getting up with Matt for a good while, and so, but Josh, our youngest one, had been sick, and I mean big sick, and I said to Sarah, you've been up with him a couple of nights, I'll take care of him. So he wakes up, two o'clock in the morning, I go in there, and I mean, this kid has done every, I mean, he has messed in the, uh, the diapers come off, he's in there finger painting in the muck, you know, he's, he's wet, he's thrown up in the bed, He's crying, and I just took one look, clicked on the light, and went, this is beyond my skill level. I mean, <laughs> I'm not sure I can redeem this mess. I walked in and said, uh, I, I need some help. And I really, I just, uh, it's out of hand. And, and she's, she says, go ahead, oh, don't sweat it, Tom, go back to bed, I'll take care of it. She pops up, I hear her in there, and she's singing. Here it is, 2 o'clock in the morning, it's like a mess. And I hear her in there singing away, I mean, just, just, positive as she can be, but it takes her half an hour to do it. Pretty soon she comes in, clicks off the light in our place, jumps in bed with me. I rolled over and I said, I really appreciate you taking care of that. But what were you singing about? What was that? I thought I'd lost her. I thought you know, finally gone over the brink. And she looked at me and said, no, she said, I was in there praising the Lord. I said, why? She said, you know, he, he has diarrhea and he threw up and he was crying and his nose was running and he was coughing up. He said, I said, yeah, that's exactly why I called for help. She said, well, I was in there just praising the Lord that his ears don't leak. Everything else did. <laughs> <laughs> now, it takes a special person to have that perspective, let me tell you. She has that ability to create hope in circumstances that are a disaster, absolute disaster. A sense of humor, will t my dad used to call a sense of humor people grease. People grease, because it allows you to bump into folks and create a lot less friction. It allows you to confront things without, it. my wife, I call it with her, she has the ability to deal with a heavy topic with a light touch. And believe me, she has to get after me and I really appreciate her light touch. Another example of her capacity. I was in a job where I was, had been a commanding officer almost constantly for seven years, Bang, one job after another, just 24 hours a day, seven days a week, troops in jail, people in trouble. It's just one of those, it drains you. And I would come home and just flop. I was exhausted. I'd be reading the newspaper. Yeah, I remember too, we have three kids at this point, and Sarah's trying to get supper on the table, change this diaper, and I'm sitting there reading baseball scores, and I really don't even like baseball, but anything to tune out. And she walks by very nicely, and one kid under the arm, trying to control this and she turns around and very sweetly says, Tom, do you know that Old Testament verse that says the Lord's mercies are new every morning? I said, yeah, I know that verse. She said, 
do you know why they're new every morning? And I said, to tell you the truth, I never really thought about it. She said, well, do you know? And I said, no, I really don't know why they're new every morning. Do you know why? She said, oh, yeah, I know why they're new every morning. I said, why is that? She said, because they run out about this time every night. <laughs> and at that point, I went, oh, you might like some help. I said, <laughs> you know, if you run it by me a couple of times, I'll get it, see? Uh, I mean, she could have yelled at me, she could have screamed at me, but she sort of, eh. <laughs> and I'm telling you, humor will get you a long way in the business of creating that positive atmosphere around you. Don't take yourself too seriously. How many of you saw in the newspaper, I think it was a year ago or so, uh, a Medal of Honor guy who got the Medal of Honor uh, from the Marine Corps for an, op for, an, for an operation in Okinawa in 1945, and they just gave it to him last year? Marine General by the name of James L. Day. Did you happen to see that? Well, Day was my boss a couple of times in the Marine Corps, and he was absolutely a wonderful man to work for. And I asked, when, I, when he was no longer my boss, I went back to him one day and said, Sir, I really, he didn't write my fitness report anymore. I didn't want him to think I was in there, you know, schmoozing. I just said, Sir, I've really enjoyed working with you and working for you. And you always felt like you worked with him. You see how I said that? But they always felt like you worked with him, not for him. He just had a wonderful touch. And I said, could you tell me something succinct so I can remember it that'll help me to be a better officer? I was a lieutenant at the time. Jim Day was a captain at that moment. He turned to me and he said, yeah, I'll tell you something that'll really help you. And I mean this. He said, take your job very seriously, but never yourself. And I saw him do that over and over. When he was an instructor at basic school, where I first ran into him, he would get up there and he'd be diagramming something, putting the rifle company in the fence, and about halfway through, and you know the way he thought it ought to go. And some lieutenant would raise his hand and say, "Sir, have you have you considered putting the machine guns on the other side of the draw?" It looks to me like you get better coverage that way. Most instructors would have gone, "No, the way we do this is the school," and they would have come up with eight reasons why they were right. Jim Day would look at it and he'd say. Lieutenant, that'll work. There's no doubt about it. that's you know if it was a good idea, he'd say that's good as certainly as good as the one I've come up with. And uh, if you want to move on the other side, we'll do that today. I mean, he just never felt attacked. He never, he never, he was always his ego was always up for grabs. Develop a sense of humor. A key you want to remember as a leader, particularly, laugh with people, never at them. Don't point out things and guile and disguise cynicism and criticism with humor. Do not do that. If you want to come up with a rolling laugh, you want to laugh at somebody, make sure it's you. That's why I love telling stories about myself and my family. We're kind of goofy. Uh, but you don't want to make fun of other people, particularly in a leadership billet. They really get offended by it. I think of a thing I tell my children, and I've said it to them over and over again, and I'm going to give you some good advice just as an officer. But I told my kids this from the time they were born, and they could repeat it to you right now. Whatever happens to you, no matter how bad things are, no matter how terrible it all is happening, two things I want you to do. Keep moving. Keep smiling. I don't care what happens to you. Get up. Keep moving. Keep smiling. And I, I can never get, forget the first time one of them said, why? My number two kid always says, why? And there's a reason for that. If you keep moving, they probably won't catch you. If you keep smiling, if they, if they do catch you and you keep smiling, they won't know what to do with you. Now, that sounds stupid, but it's true. Whatever happens to you, keep moving, keep smiling. Don't ever lay there and wait for somebody to pronounce the words over you. Get up and keep moving. An example of, of humor that really made the day and counted the tension. Have any of you read the story of the Marines at the Chosin Reservoir when they were surrounded by 13 Chinese divisions? One Marine division surrounded by 13 Chinese divisions. The Chinese entered the war up in the northern part of Korea. We didn't expect that, we weren't ready for it, and the next thing you know, the 1st Marine Division was surrounded. The people on their left, uh, General Puller, Chesty Puller, some of you may know of him. Puller was 
a guy who won five Navy Crosses, the second medal underneath the Medal of Honor, won five of them in his career. But he was a wonderfully humorous guy, too. He's tough as nails, but he was humorous. And when this thing happened, he called over to the unit over here, and he said, uh, on his left, uh, an ROK unit, a Korean unit, and he talked to him over there, and he said, how many Chinese do you think we're up against? Because they had no idea that this was going to happen to them. And these guys said, there are thousands of them. Everywhere we looked, they're Chinese. I mean, they were, everybody was reeling from this whole thing. He said, well, thank you. And he was in a staff meeting. He was on the staff phone. He had a speaker phone on his radio. So he calls over to the Army unit on his side, and they said the same thing. Sir, there are thousands of them out there. I mean, thousands of them. He said, look, you got a Marine up there who's a sergeant. I met him a couple of days ago. He's from Wheeling, West Virginia. Uh, that Marine sergeant who's the forward observer, would you put him on the radio for me? He gets on and he says, sorry, you remember me? I was up talking to you up there a couple of days. Oh, yes, sir. <laughs> you know, you don't forget people like General Fuller. And, uh, and uh, yes, sir, I do. And he said, well, I'm looking for some kind of estimate up there that will give us some idea. And I know you're, a, a, you know, just a plain old country boy. Tell me what you see out there. What do you think we're up against? How many Chinese do you think we're looking at? Pardon my language, the kid looked, got on the radio and he said, Sir, there's a whole piss pot full of them. At that point, Puller turned around and announced to his staff, who'd heard this remark over the radio, he said, Thank God somebody up there can count. <laughs> 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 you see? And what it did, it just took the edge off. Everybody was wound up thinking they were going to get overrun any minute, and all of a sudden they were laughing and back to work. And, you know, a sense of humor is one of the ways that you create a positive atmosphere around you. Be careful not to laugh at people, always with them. Make sure that you take yourself not too seriously. Make sure your ego's up for grabs. Take your job and your profession very seriously. That's as good advice as I can give you. Um, Proverbs 17.22 tells us that a merry heart is like medicine. And it really is. It's like medicine. I can't tell you how many times my wife has healed a rift in our family by just coming up with the right little funny quip. And things happen all the time. I think one more story I have to tell you. My son, who's six seven now, a little over six seven, uh, is a world class high jumper. He was born to run and jump. He never learned to walk at all. He just bing, 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 is all over the place. And he had more energy than, you know, about three mongoose. Uh, he was yes. all over the place. And he got a new pair of, of these bedroom things, you know, the Mickey Mouse ears, you know, from Disneyland. That's what he wanted for Christmas. And he got these for Christmas. And, I mean, he was field testing them. <laughs> he looked like the Roadrunner. You've seen those cartoons in our house. All over the place. And I stopped him. I said, son, that's for outside, not inside. He couldn't have been more than about four, I guess. And I said, you're going to crash into some furniture, break the furniture, hurt yourself. Your mother's going to get both of us. So slow down, please. Yes, sir. <laughs> I mean, it just didn't do any good. He just had too much energy. And we had a place where you came out of the den and, and you went from the carpet onto the tile floor in the, in the, in the kitchen. And it was a, not a tile floor, it was a not linoleum, but the next thing up. What's that? No, it's like congolium or some one-piece floor. And anyway, it was it was slick. My wife had waxed that, and, it looked, and I said, "Son, you get in here. That wax is going to take you out." <laughs> Let me tell you. Oh yes, sir. I understand. Boom. <laughs> so about two that afternoon, he comes flying out of the out of the uh, the the den there, hits the hits the uh, wax. And, it's over. Sort of the end over end drill. Whack his head right in the corner of the cabinet. Didn't need any stitches, but a little cut, you know, and a nice knot on his head. And he was a pretty sensitive kid. He really was. He didn't want to cry, but he sort of. And I walked over and I thought, here's my moment. You know, I've been saying this all day long. And I said, aha, I seized the moment kind of thing. And I said, Matt, did you learn something here? And he went, well, yes, sir. I said, first of all, I said, are you okay? And, you know, kind of comforted him. But, but I said, did you learn something here? And he looks up at me and goes, yes, sir. I said, is it something you think you can remember? And he said, yes, sir. I said, well, what did you learn? He pointed down his feet and he says, I know why they call them slippers. <laughs> I mean, I used to run around to myself saying, when does dad get to win one? I mean, I, I was always being whipped. 
But a sense of humor will get you a long, long way in life, let me tell you. It'll get you through a lot of really sticky situations. The next thing I want you to remember about hope, you create hope, a sense of positive hope around you, by creating opportunity for other people to succeed. By creating opportunity for other people to succeed. And I don't mean just so as it comes up. You sit down and in your time when you pray for those troops, you think about things that they might could do well. You think about opportunities you can make available to them to go to a school, to get to a job that would help them. And you create an opportunity for the other guy to succeed. I can give you example after example after example of good leadership that did that. My, my dad was that kind of guy. He constantly looked out for other people, and when they needed something professionally or personally, he made sure they got it. When I came on active duty in the Marine Corps, my dad was only a major when he got out. I had colonels and generals who came to me as a lieutenant and said, if you ever need anything, you let me know. Your dad was one of the most caring, giving people I've ever known. He took care of me. Several colonels came to me and said, your dad was the guy that recommended me for a commission at Guadalcanal or at Tarawa. He said he was always helping other people get where they needed to go. And it made a difference. I mean, my life was easy in the Marine Corps early on because, it, and you always tell what kind of guy your dad is when you work for somebody that worked for your dad, let me tell you. You'll know in a hurry what they thought of him. And I inherited a wonderful legacy. I would just encourage you that <clears throat> when you think of other people, create an opportunity for them to succeed. When I was younger, my, I mentioned my younger brother to you. He's just moved down to Charleston. I talked to him this morning. He's a guy that I just love. Like I mean, he and I have never argued. My older brother and I fought like dogs. My younger brother and I have just always gotten along really well, and he's just a dear Christian. But I can remember when he was a little kid and he came home from school after they did the testing at the, in the first grade, and they had a, sent a note and said, "There's no way this kid could be as handicapped as he is, and it's impossible. But we need to get him checked." So we took him to a specialist. And they discovered he had 10% hearing in one ear and was totally deaf in the other and was legally blind. Now, we knew he didn't see very well because he kept bumping into things. But, uh, uh, but he just, he funca you know, he functioned. He was in school. He wasn't behind in school. He was reading above grade. But the teachers noticed he just read everything about here. <laughs> and he could, he could read out about an inch or two off his nose, and that was all he could do. And he sat in school and didn't hear much of what went on, but he'd come home and studied on his own. And I remember my dad sitting down and saying, whatever this family does, we gotta make sure Ron gets the help he needs. If he needs help with his homework, don't even ask why. Sit down and work with him. And all of us just picked up the slack. My brother never went to a day of special school in his life. He graduated number one in his class academically in college. He graduated number one in his Ph.D. class at Texas, University of Texas, with a degree in uh, electroanalytical chemistry. Um, he is just the most normal, everyday, fun guy you've ever seen. And if you said, all the handicapped people over here, it would never enter his mind that he's handicapped. My folks made sure, my dad retired from the Marine Corps and worked as a janitor for a year. And somebody asked him why. He said, just want to make sure I can do a day's work. That's all. I've been an officer for the last 15 years. I want to make sure I can do a day's work. <laughs> he said, and if I do well at that, he said, I'm going to go to college. He never finished high school. And they said, really? And he said, yeah. He said, why at this age would you go to college? He said, all my life people told me if I'd gone to college, I might have amounted to something. He said, I'm going to go prove them wrong. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I mean about a sense of humor and not taking yourself seriously. <laughs> Exhibit A. They, my folks lived in a little tiny college apartment that you know people that have been married about a week get. My folks have been married for 30 years, and they moved their junk in there. And my younger brother, they had this boy who was in, in high school by that time, uh, it wasn't your average college apartment, let me tell you. And yet, there was always room for my brother's chemistry projects. My dad studied in a little cubby hole that was nothing. And yet, where there was a nice room and a bedroom back there, my younger brother had a place to set up his chemistry set. Actually, they moved in there. It was in the eighth grade. I came home and said, Ron, what's your latest project? 
He said, well, I'm, I got this thing going right now, and I'm doing a plot on these chemical things, and I've got this thing all laid out, and I'm, I'm analyzing the electromagnetic spectrum. I was a physics major. I was a junior. I was, going, I was a senior, and, and I went, wait a minute. Now, we, we studied that last year. I mean, he's in the eighth grade. And so, but wherever they lived, there was room for his project. They gave him an, no, he couldn't play football. No, he couldn't do the things that we did because he couldn't see nothing. We took him out to play baseball. They said, hit the baseball. And he went, what ball? <laughs> you know, shoot the ball through the rim up there in basketball. Rim? <laughs> I mean, it was a little, so we ran track, ran track. He won the state, uh, set the state record in, in the half mile. And somebody asked him, well, boy, how did you do that with all the, <laughs> my brother looked up and he said, my dad taught me all you need to know about track and about a minute. And he said, what was that? And he said, don't start till the gun starts. <laughs> don't quit running until you hit the tape. How many guys hit the tape? The first guy. <laughs> Stay off the grass and turn left. And he said, that's... <laughs> you know, what's the problem? You know? <laughs> so, you know, Creating opportunity for other people to succeed, making sure they get the encouragement, not sitting around talking about, well, you can't play football and basketball. Find something you can do and do it well. Creating opportunity. When you raise children, you're going to find each one of your kids is really different. I mean, they come out of the you know, same gene pool. You'd never prove it with my kids. Let me tell you, they're, <laughs> they're all over the place. And yet, Proverbs tells us what? Train up a child in the way that he should go, or she, but not the way you think they ought to go. To be a good parent, you've got to study that child and figure out what they're going to do well. And you create an opportunity for them to succeed based on the gifts and abilities that God has given them. You don't sit down and stamp them out in the mold, let me tell you. It doesn't work. You can try, but it doesn't work. So creating opportunity for others. I often said I had a lot of fun and enjoyed even a modicum of success as a Marine. I will tell you one of the things I'm the most happy about, probably the proudest of of my whole thing, and that was that when I was a platoon commander back in 1961-62, I had a wonderful platoon, got a great bunch of characters, and we were good. We were the best. I, I'm convinced to this day, I tell you, that we were the best rifle platoon in the 2nd Marine Division. There's no doubt in my mind. And I don't think anybody that was down there would question that. We were just good at what we did. But I'm proud of the fact that my platoon sergeant, Henry Harden, retired from the Marine Corps as a sergeant major. I encouraged him to go for promotion. I made sure he got the things he needed. I'm also proud that two of my three squad leaders got commissioned during the Vietnam War and retired from the, from the Marine Corps as majors or lieutenant colonels. They were good men. I kept encouraging them. Apply for this program. I had a case where one of them, Doug Phelps, who was one of my most talented guys, this was a guy, let me tell you, I, the kind of people I inherited. Doug Phelps was a sergeant with about eight years in the Marine Corps at the time. At that time in the Marine Corps Institute, this is a, um, what do you call it, mail order, you know, uh, correspondence course school, there were, I think, 110 courses that you could take in all kinds of specialties. Doug was a sergeant, had just made sergeant at, at, at the sort of seven, eight year period. And I looked at his record book. He had finished 85 of the 110 MCI courses at that time, Marine Corps Institute courses. He'd also finished the officer's basic school course as a sergeant. And he finished that as a corporal. And he came to me and asked me, can I enroll in amphibious warfare school, which is a captain's level course. When you've got people with that kind of initiative, let me tell you, being a leader, is a little threatening because it's very easy to visualize him running it and you going, yes, sir. <laughs> and that's exactly what I did. And for that reason, I encouraged him, apply for the officer program. I would love, I would love to see you get commissioned. Now, he applied for the war officer program in the field called the 8500, which is the military police unit, and it was kind of a brig. His MOS had to do with uh, being a brig guard. Well, if he had gotten commissioned, uh, a commissioned warrant officer, he could have only gone to about W-2 at the most 
you know, one promotion. That's all he had left his entire Marine career because it was such a narrow, limited field. I said, Doug, I've looked at your application. You're qualified beyond comprehension. There's nothing in the world that would keep you from being selected except that I won't recommend you for it. He was a little torqued. He was a little annoyed. Why not? I said, cool down. I said, the reason I won't do it is because you got one promotion in that field and you're better than that. I want you to put in for an unrestricted officer commission. Pick a field that will give you a decent field, infantry, artillery, combat arms, support, where you've got an unlimited potential in front of you. I'll write you a report that you won't believe it's you. He went, <laughs> still wasn't happy. Six months goes by, and they put it in again, and I turned him down again. And I told him, if I say no, there ain't no point in forwarding that thing. He understood that. If your platoon commander didn't, didn't recommend you, you weren't going to get it. It was the competition. They only picked about one out of 50, 60 guys who applied. And he was, be he was the best out of five or 600, not 50 or 60. But he needed to be an unrestricted officer. About a year later, when the Vietnam War was cranked up, they commissioned him. Uh, unrestricted officer, and he went right on. I mean, he could have gone on. He got out as a lieutenant colonel, could have been a general in my mind. He just decided to get out. He's the executive assistant of the guy who runs the highway patrol in the state of Indiana now. Great guy. That was a tough one for me. It hurt me to say no to him because he was so calm. But I wanted to get him in a better opportunity and give him a bigger vision of himself than he had. So creating an opportunity for other people. Keeping a sense of humor, constantly creating opportunities for other people to succeed. I had a kind of a disaster uh, one time when my adjutant came to me and said, Sir, I, I finally got to school. I've applied for it. He was a, this guy was in a former enlisted, and he was in the administrative field, the 01 field in the Marine Corps, and really good. His name was Dick Rothrock. And Dick came in and said, Sir, I finally got the admin school I need to let me make the captain. And I said, you really need to go to that school. What do you mean? He said, and I went, uh, 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 I could be enthusiastic. The school convened three days before the inspector general arrived at my unit to inspect it. Going through an inspector general's inspection without an adjutant is uh, nigh on to suicide. And I went, uh, do they have any other courses? <laughs> you know, and he went, that's it, sir. That's my one chance. And he said, I'll understand. Then he saw that calm down and he said, gosh, I hadn't realized that was right when the adjutant, I mean, when the uh, inspector general was coming, uh, uh, yeah, I understand, sir, it's okay. I left the dick, you're going to school. The rest of us are going to jail, but you're going to school. <laughs> and don't sweat it. I got all the staff guy together, and then all of you who know my administrative abilities, you can know that without an adjutant, there was no hope. But I got the admin chief together, a couple other guys, the five or six guys that he worked with, and I said, troops, I will be here every night working with you to help you. We're going to get this thing ready, and Captain Rothrock's going to the school he needs, and we'll go through the IG without him, and I hope we live through it. And I just ask your help. You can't imagine how hard those kids worked. He, they, they respected Captain Rothrock. They saw it. They understood it was an opportunity for him. It was his one opportunity to go on and make major and maybe lieutenant colonel as a former enlisted Marine. He had about nine or ten years enlisted. It's hard for those guys to get promoted in a shrinking Marine Corps. We were going down in size, and we went almost half. It cut us almost in half in those years. And for an ex-enlisted guy to get on the major and lieutenant colonel was hard. But I'll tell you, they closed ranks around him. Dick Rock Rothrock went on, got, his thing, got promoted uh, a couple of years later, and we survived the IG. We got through it without sending me to jail. Uh, there were a few glitches that we lived through, but I, I just can't tell you that was important. Where did I learn that? I learned it from my dad. You take care of other people. You create opportunity for them. You don't worry about yourself that much. I'm not saying that's the school solution, but for us it worked and the kids pulled together to make it happen. The P in hope is praise. We need to learn to praise. And the way you start learning to praise people is you start praising God. If you will spend a portion of your prayer time simply praising God and acknowledging the good. You see, if I lose my sense of gratefulness, 
if I lose my sense of wonder and awe and appreciation for the God who created the universe, it's very easy to overlook the routine things that people down here do. See, if I can't praise God for the wondrous things he does, how am I to remember to praise you? I'm not. We form a habit. We form a mental outlook that gives us the ability to praise others by praising God. Because when I go in and praise God, I see the wondrous things he does. I acknowledge them. I recount them. And then when I go out and see other people, there's a positive side of me that's been built up by being in God's presence, involved in praise, that allows me to see just how good people do things. And I'll tell you, that's how it works for me. It may work different for you, but that's how it works for me. Learning to praise God is the beginning of learning to praise other people. We become, when we praise God and realize how much he loves us and cares for us and takes care of us, uh, we all of a sudden are a lot more appreciative to him. That makes us more appreciative to the people we work with. We need, God doesn't need to hear our praises. I can remember thinking as a guy, why does he want me to come in there and tell him all this stuff? He already knows it. You know, and then my, my poor logical brain used to struggle with that. And I would think, why does he need that? And the answer is simple. He doesn't. I do. <laughs> you get it? Praise isn't for God. We do praise him. But the benefit that's reaped from it isn't from him or for him. It's for us. Because it sets our heart right. It gives us an appreciation of who he really is. It puts things in perspective. It allows us to see things as they really are. And we come out of that encouraged, able to praise others, feeling unthreatened. So praise is a very, very important part of being a good leader. When you talk about getting after people, General Buckingham talked about it the other day, you don't go inspect something to go find a mistake. You go inspect somebody to make sure you see what they do and tell them, hey, that's exactly what I'm looking for. How many times I went and I, I was thrilled to be able to say to some PFC, you're keeping that log just exactly like we wanted you to. Good job. Or inspecting the weapons. These weapons are never seen. Great job. That's what you're looking for. If you find a problem, yeah, you need to deal with that. But you deal with that off to the side and quietly. But when there's an opportunity to praise somebody, make sure he hears it and other people hear it as well. Whenever there's credit for something that happens in your unit, don't stand up there and go, yeah, I did a great job, you know, got this thing organized. You know, turn around, because the truth is, if you're an officer, some seaman second or some chief or some first class made that happen. Might have been your idea. And the quicker you learn to give ideas away and credit for them, the better off you'll be. Because other people, when you, even when you have an idea, and it's your idea, and you give it to the guy and sort of encourage him to do it, and he does it, and the boss comes up, you don't, when you turn around and say, first class so-and-so got this done, and I thought it was an incredible effort on his part, did a super job, don't bother to mention yourself. When you do that, he knows where the idea came from. And what does he think of you? Boy, he said, gosh, he didn't mind giving me the credit. I had a boss when I worked for the Army. Interesting guy. Strange dude. Uh, really was. You ever seen that picture, the American Gothic? Of the guy, you know, kind of standing there with a pitchfork and his wife, you know, that picture? He and his wife could have posed for that thing. I'm not kidding you. That's exactly what they looked like. When I first met him, I sort of went, oh, pardon me, sir. Uh, uh, I mean, he really was an egghead of the first order. Well, one of the things I noticed right off was when I worked uh, in things, when you wrote up things, uh, you know, you'd submit papers and things and do studies on things, which I did a lot of in the counter-terrorist business, and they would go through the next headquarters. They always left there with the boss's signature on them. Okay, I mean, that's okay. Most of the stuff I write, I'm glad somebody else got credit for it, but that's another story. Uh, but this guy, I noticed something. When I sent stuff to him, he would look at it, make some very positive comments, put an endorsement on it, and make sure it went forward with your name on it. Struck me as funny. I thought, hmm, kind of an unusual guy. And, partic and if it was wrong or something went wrong with it, he often would just get up and walk back down to your office and say, you know, I, 
I don't think this is quite what we want, what, what you want to come to. What do you think about this? And he'd have you change it, get it straight, and then he'd bring it down, put a nice endorsement on it, take no credit at all for what he'd done, and send it forward with your name on it. I thought, hmm, I wonder what this guy's made of. Well, I tell you what he's made of. He was made out of a big chunk of Christ. He was a great Christian. Didn't know that when he first came in. I picked it up when I was with him one day, and his wife, let me just say this, his wife was one of the most unattractive women I've ever seen. She just was, I mean, just wasn't there, folks. I'm sorry. It just wasn't there. And on top of it, she had suffered from a stroke, and that was part of it. Part of her face was kind of paralyzed, and she suffered from a stroke, and she had difficulty speaking, and she wasn't physically, never had been physically attractive. You could see that. Age hadn't helped her, uh, and the stroke did. And I was astounded when he came to our house one time. I've never met a man who more or overtly loved his wife. He was, you know, he looked after her in every way imaginable, never put her in a situation where she felt awkward, was always quick to be by, there by her when she struggled with a word or something. Very quick, you know, he was very loving in his speech toward her. And at that point, I said, this guy's got to be a Christian. And so I said, sir, we have a Bible study. Would you be interested in coming? He said, I'd be delighted to come. And he came, and this guy was a, a deep wellspring of biblical knowledge. You see, praise. He praised his wife openly in public. I couldn't believe it when I first saw it. And then I saw how he made sure that whatever praise there was for the work that was done went to the guy that did it. And when something went wrong or a paper wasn't accepted, he was the first guy to take responsibility for it. Those kind of people are hard to find. Be one and you'll have followers. Be one of those kind of guys, you'll have followers. I want to cover the last point in hope, and that's encouragement. There are all kinds of courage that's talked about. You know the the uh, time when Joshua's getting ready, he's taken over as the boss from uh, Moses. What are the words you hear over and over again to Joshua? Be strong and of courage. Be strong and of good courage. I almost think this record's broken when you're reading that. It just goes over and over and over. You know why? Because at that point, it's clear to me God understands what encouragement's about. Encouragement's not about being a cheerleader. Ah, go get them, tiger. That's not encouragement. Could be, but usually it isn't. Hey, guys, you need to be quiet, okay? Good. Encouragement's not about some sort of cheerleading exercise. It is exactly what it says. It's about putting courage in. If you can remember that, it will help you. I can't tell you how many times in combat we would get some overwhelmingly complex operation assigned to us, and I would look at it and go, uh, uh. at one time we had to move our command post from Hill 10 to Hill 37. At the same time, I had to keep up the same op tempo I'd been running, and at the same time, the, the, the whole unit was moving several, about 10 or 15 miles, and I had antennas down, and I thought, this is, it was so confusing. There were so many moving parts. I had almost 2,000 people in the battalion. I was the S3, and I had no help at all. I mean, all, I had one lieutenant assigned in the three shop. I rated seven captains in there. I had one lieutenant, a second lieutenant who'd been a linebacker at Alabama and was relieved for bad judgment out in the field, and so they put him in the three shop with me. <laughs> I mean, it was a zoo. I looked at the job of moving it and thinking, I've got to be here. I can't be there. I've got to leave Terry by... I can't leave Terry here. <laughs> He'll kill everybody. I mean, the guy was a nice kid. He just didn't have it. It just a little short in the up locker here. Uh, but I went into this meeting with my boss. Uh, actually, it was the XO, a guy named Paul Slack, was a Naval Academy graduate in 1955. And Paul sat down, and I'll never forget. He went through that thing. We worked out a plan. came up with a plan. I walked out of that thing. I actually knew what I was doing. I walked out of there and I felt confident. Yeah, we'll get this thing done. There is a way to skin that cat. If I just take care of this and follow this, and we did it fine. I walked out and I realized what he had done by coming alongside and not critiquing me or saying, let me tell you how to do this. He said, Tom, let's look at this thing. See what we got to do. Where can I help? Where can I fill? 
when you displace down here, you let me run this end of it up here, you take that end down there. And Paul, I trusted implicitly. I'd been with him the first tour in Vietnam. He was much, he was five years older than I was, but we'd been in the same unit doing the same job as advisors the first tour. So I had great confidence. I was all of a sudden, this thing's doable. I walked out of there encouraged. He had put the courage in my heart to give it a good whirl. Did I know for sure we'd get it done right? No, but I sure felt like we could. Where I'd walked in there and I absolutely could not imagine this thing coming off without killing somebody. Encouragement, putting something in. Be strong and courageous is what God tells Joshua. We need to be the kind of people that put courage in the other guy. You never put courage in the other guy by putting him down. Never. You never put courage in somebody by critiquing them. Never. You put courage in. Yeah, you may have to tell them, here's the thing we need to do differently. But learn the art of coming alongside and encouraging rather than critiquing. Building people up rather than pushing them down. I, I just can't tell you how important that is. Well, I've mentioned to you humor, opportunity for others, praise, and encouragement. That spells hope, folks. And if you want to be a leader, you create a positive atmosphere around yourself of hope. Be a person prepared to give a reason for the hope that's in you. Acknowledge and live a life that shows Christ in you, the hope of glory. Because people who dispense hope and create hope have followers. People who have followers are called leaders. And it's that simple. God gives us a great advantage. Great advantage in being a leader. I'm convinced of that. Because we understand it. He's done all those things for us. Which of us here says that God doesn't have a sense of humor? If you don't believe he has a sense of humor, you're not paying attention. Has God created opportunity for you and me? Absolutely. He gave us an opportunity to be his child by sending his son here. Does God give us hearts that can praise him, that can teach us how to praise others? He sure does. Does he encourage us? Absolutely. All of this stuff is right out of the book, which brings me to the next thing I want to talk to you about. And I'll quit here in just a moment. There are some little Bible books here. These are called 100 Days Bible Study. This booklet was written by the adjutant at Sandhurst during the years 1921 to 1924. It is as current as today's newspaper. There, since I have become a Christian 45 years ago, no book outside the Bible has had as much influence on my life as this book. I can't tell you how many times I've gone through it. It takes and breaks things up sort of topically. It collects scripture for you in a way that shows you how to study. It suggests some ideas of how to study. It supposedly takes you a hundred days to get through this thing, doing one little section. And the little sections aren't very big. There's one section there, another one here and there. So there are like two-thirds of a page. But there, it's two-thirds of a page of solid meat. I love it. It's military. It's concise. You don't have to have nine reference books. You stick that in your pocket, and you get a minute, you got a break, you go through it, you read it that night, take it down, look up the references. You go through this book. I, it's the, one, the best grounding, the best foundation I can think of. Not just if you're going in the military. I've given them to my boys and said, get your nose in there and don't take it out till you finish. I've told my daughters the same thing. This book is foundational. It's mostly scripture. There's a few thoughts thrown in, but it's mostly scripture. But it's organized in a way that will make sense to you. I cannot think of any... Those of you who know John Grenells, how, I know who John Grenells is. Raise your hand. John Grenells is your average Marine <coughs> infantry officer. A Rhodes Scholar out of college. Two degrees from Oxford an MBA from Harvard, a couple of years as a White House fellow, sort of your routine, everyday infantry officer, okay? Everybody understand that? If you believe that, i got a bridge I'll sell you, okay? Uh, the truth is, he's a wonderful guy. This pamphlet, he would tell you the same thing. I gave him one of these in Vietnam on our second tour after I'd prayed for John for five years. This booklet is what led John Reynolds to the Lord and grounded him in the scripture. 
I cannot tell you how important it is. I'll leave a few more with Tom. Tom's got some back there, I know. But I encourage you, particularly, let me just tell you, if you're not going to do it now, when you're over the summer and you've got, you know, something like 80, 90 days, I would tell you, between now and the end of summer, you ought to get through this book. It's a, I don't know, I quit. you got to do it. It's important. No book outside the scriptures itself have been as helpful and as meaningful to me. The first one I got with, uh, of these, Cleo Buxton gave me in 1957. I still have it. I still have it. It has a different cover. Got these airborne guys off the front, which I thought was a plus. Uh, I told them if they reprint this thing, I want some real people on there. You know, Not them airborne guys. Uh, how many have been to jump school? Yeah, a couple of you admit it. I see. Okay. <laughs> I went to jump school. In fact, I had over a thousand parachute jumps. People always ask me if night jumps bothered me, and I told them, heck no, they're all night jumps. <laughs> what a pro. <laughs> okay. Next sales pitch. You've heard about Rocky Mountain High. I want to tell you, I see so much potential out there, and you all, it is just absolutely encouraging to me. It really is. This program, in my opinion, and in the opinion of other people who are better qualified than me to comment, for what it does, it's designed as an outdoor leadership school, but it's not a school to teach you how to do a bunch of outdoor activities. It's a school that looks at teaching leadership from a military point of view in a military context, but doing it outside in the field where it's fun. That's what it's about. It's a nine, ten-day course. only costs, I think, $360. That's a gift. Enroll in a nine- or ten-day uh, outward bound course, and you're going to pay a couple thousand. This course is cheap, and I'll tell you why it's cheap, because guys like me go back and work in it for nothing. And I can tell you, let me, let me just throw this out. Do you know what I get paid an hour when I teach? My standard fee, talk, talking for a corporate, is a thousand bucks an hour. That's what I make. It's nothing. I go back there. I can't tell you how many months I've given them. And I'll keep right on doing it because I believe in it. There are guys who come through there who join you as assistant instructors or people who will come through the course with you, and you can't pay them the kind of money it takes. The guy who ran this course for me when I was the director of Spring Canyon for several years, Don Snow, some of you know Don, he's sort of the gremlin of the mountain. Uh, I, I, he's a little wiry guy. He's about 66 years old now. And I mean, he's sort of knotty. It reminds me of just a knurled old knot is what he looks like. I tell him I loved him around there at Spring Canyon because the only thing around there older than I was. Uh, but he is a, what would it cost to pay a guy with the credentials and the background that Don Snow has? You couldn't find a guy. I can tell you, Outward Bound doesn't have anybody that's as qualified as Don. Not to mention the fact that Don's a fine Christian. And he's a wonderful army officer and has a great experience. Also was enlisted in the army. What do we pay him? Every penny he's worth, I tell him. Nothing. <laughs> and I told him, if you don't shape up, I'm going to cut your pay in half, too. Don't, don't forget that. But the reason the course is inexpensive is because there are guys who believe in it, who come back, help in the course, and it's a good course. And I'm going to tell you this. I don't think it's optional. I don't think it's something you can go oh, yeah, well, I might find time to do that. I think at some point while you're at the Naval Academy, you need to go. I don't have any hesitation saying that. You need to go. Will it be the high point, the change point in your life? I don't know. It may or it may not. But I guarantee you, you'll leave there knowing it was worth every penny you spent and every minute you, you gave to going through the course. Jeff Bartkowski. Anybody here know who Jeff is? Jeff was the brigade commander at the Naval Academy, I think in 83 or 84, wasn't it? 84. When an admiral asked Jeff Bartkowski what he th why, in why he bothered to go to Rocky Mountain High, I almost had a heart attack. As Jeff turned, and he's a very quiet kind of guy, kind of academic guy in a lot of ways. Jeff very quietly turned and he said, "Sir, I really enjoyed going through Rocky Mountain High." He said, "Well, Jeff, you were the brigade commander. Obviously, you. What were you up there studying leadership for? What's the problem?" Jeff turned and told the admiral, "He said, "Sir, I learned more practical leadership." in the 10 days I was at Rocky Mountain High than I did my four years at the Naval Academy. The Admiral went, huh? And I sort of went, uh, well, m m m <laughs> uh, 
But it is worth it. It is something you need to schedule. I would say the sooner, the earlier you can go, the better. I would encourage you to look. They run about six or seven courses every summer. Something should fit a leave schedule. And I would encourage every one of you to, to schedule a time to go. I would encourage you specifically to try to find, to go in threes and fours. If you can get three or four guys to go and you'll come back and you'll be welded together in a ministry team, you'll just be a lot closer to each other. It'll be something you can come back and pay back into the ministry with Tom Thompson. I want you to go to that. I know he's interested. I'm sure he'll reinforce some of what I've said. He's taken time to come out and be a part of the course before. Uh, As I said, I've been through it, uh, and I just feel like it's really worthwhile. Get through this book. Get grounded in the Scriptures. Get to Rocky Mountain High. You'll benefit from it. Even if you're about to graduate, take some of your graduation leave. We have a lot of guys who go through as ensigns and lieutenants, a lot of them. But if you're an undergrad now and you've got a couple more years, I'd much rather you come through as an undergrad so you can come back and help out the Thompsons. It's that simple. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this wonderful group of young people that you've brought together. I thank you for their love for you. I pray that any that are here that might not know you might have come to the point where they want to be drawn to the Savior. I pray, Lord, you'd work in their hearts that they wouldn't be quiet about that conviction. They'd find a friend. They'd come to one of the other officers who's here, one of the -the over-the-hill gang like me or Bob Underhill, and say, how do I come to, how do I commit my life to Christ? I just encourage you, Lord, to work in their lives. We don't know what that's about. We don't, but don't let them forget about it. Don't let them lose the bubble of uh, that you love them and you care about them. Don't let them forget that, yes, they're sinners and they need that sin forgiven. They need their relationship restored with their Creator. Help them to seek out the one that could be of most help to them, Lord, so that they might come and be your child, might come and commit their lives to Christ. Pray, Lord, those that are here that already know you, they'll go home with some of these goofy stories and funny little widgets to help them remember things, but they'll sit down and say, I need to understand that giants are part of the program. I need to know about hope. I need to remember leaders at the front, guys like David and Nehemiah and Peter. I need to deal with that whole spectrum of stuff like David as he goes out to fight Goliath and remember that you go out there to fight in your own strength and you get whipped and you go out and you fight in your strength and you depend on you to win and you give you the the, the glory and the credit for it and great successes can be had. God, we thank you for this time, for those that are here on the staff at White Sulphur Springs, for their selfless service to you and to these, that weekends like this are possible. God, build them up. Bless them for their time and their efforts. Thank you, Father. Give us a safe trip back. Give us hearts that are praising you, that we might be the people that others want to follow. And let us lead them on to Jesus Christ, for we pray in his name. Amen. Thank you very much. This will be the last time I get to harass you, so I want to thank you for letting me come and be a part of your weekend. And I want you to know that I'm grateful to have come.